Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this installment of the Corbell webinar series. Today, I'm very pleased to have with us Dana Chernoskova from Scientifica Events for Science. I'm Vera Matzer, and I'm involved in the Corbell project on behalf of Embo ABI. And I'll host today's webinar, and at the end, I'll also be manning the question function. So before I introduce our speaker, um, I just want to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded. That includes the question and answer session that we'll have at the end. Um, the video and slides will be made available on the Corbell YouTube channel after the um, webinar, and um, that will be embedded on the Corbell website as well. It'll probably take a couple of days for that to appear. We've reserved some questions at the end of the session, some time for questions. Uh, what I'd like to ask you to do is if a question comes up, just write it into the GoToWebinar question panel, which you see a picture of here, and then we'll go through them at the end. Now, before we um, start our, the webinar, I'd like to briefly introduce the Corbell project to you. So Corbell is a Horizon 2020 funded project bringing together 13 research infrastructures in the biomedical sciences. And Corbell aims to transform the understanding of bio, biological mechanisms and to help translate them into medical care. Now, modern biological and biomedical research involves complex projects, which often combine a variety of different technologies and operate at the interface between different disciplines. Now, Corbell aims to help these projects by harmonizing access and services for complex research projects across more than one RI. So our presenter today is Dana Chernoskova. She has 10 years experience in event management, both in academia and in industry. She has led the organization and planning of well over 450 scientific events by now from different sizes, including EMBO conferences and AGM meetings for European research infrastructures all across Europe. Working with universities and research infrastructures, government bodies, as well as in SMEs and industry partners. She was involved in numerous European research grants and has detailed knowledge of funding requirements and eligibility criteria and different national and European funding programs. Now, in January 2019, she started her own consulting business, Scientifica, which helps and supports university research consortia and companies to organize scientific events and to engage with their stakeholders. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Dana. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Vera, for a kind introduction. I'm very pleased uh, I can share my experience uh, here in a Corbel webinar series. Today at the webinar, I would like to focus on the key aspects uh, and a practical aspect for the event organization, which I divided um, into three phases. I would like I would like to try to uh, highlight uh, important actions which should help you uh, to plan and organize your future events more smoothly. And uh, hopefully after this webinar, you will be able to avoid the common uh, mistakes. I will also um, briefly touch the important considerations and criteria for the events uh, which are funded from uh, EU grants. And um, uh, at the end, I will speak about the important aspects for the um, event communication and also GDPR, which is um, important uh, nowadays. Before we start, um, I would like to emphasize that the event management is really very complex work and requires um, a multitasking. According to uh, Wikipedia, uh, we can see here the description what event management management is and even what, what event manager needs to do. So um, Wikipedia says that uh, the event manager is the person who plans and executes the event, taking responsibility for the creative, technical and logistic elements. This includes uh, overall event design, brand building, marketing, communication strategy, audiovisual production, logistics, budgeting, negotiation, and the client service, and as we all know, um, many more. So 
as I said at the beginning, uh, I have uh, divided that uh, even cycle uh, into three phases. So today uh, we will speak about what, what we, sh we shouldn't uh, forget before the event, during and after. There is a lot of things um, we, we can talk about, but uh, today I'll try to highlight the, the, uh, the important things. So the phase one, uh, the planning, which is uh, very important for, for all of us, um, it's um, the first part which I would like to talk about is the planning itself. So we should really start early with uh, fixed hard deadlines. So this is very important for the e event itself. So if we, once we know uh, when the event uh, will happen, we should consider the time which we which we uh, need for uh, the real preparation. Um, here I would recommend, um, it might be one month, it might be even one year or, or more. It really depends on the size uh, of the event. Uh, so what, what I would recommend here, uh, if you start to, to plan your hard deadlines, uh, do it retrospectively. So when you have the date of the event, uh, you will need some time for the final preparation. So you have to set the, the date for the uh, closing the registration. Usually, um, in what I recommend, it's two weeks, three weeks, uh, it might be one month. Then you also need some time when people will register. So uh, again, it might be couple of weeks, one month, sometimes for big events, even half a year. It really depends if they need to submit the posters or uh, uh, the other parts of um, the registration. So then um, you have to set the, the date for when, when the, the registration will be open. And you should open the registration uh, when you have the program ready. So the program needs some time also to, to make it uh, make it uh, ready so this in my perspective will show you uh, the key deadlines and and the timeline which you need for for the uh, even preparation what is really important usually you work with the other people uh, in um, in the organizing committee or um, sometimes it's just another committee which is doing just the program and I really recommend to you to, to confirm this timeline and the hard deadlines in Britain with all involved in that event planning. For that um, I use what I called planning document um, and I really recommend here to keep all the information in one document. So here um, and at the slide you can see that it's uh, what I use or with my team. It's a basic um, Excel sheet with um, different tabs and we are keeping all the information um, um, at, at one document. So you see key deadlines, organizing committee, actions, everything is in, in one document. It's very helpful, especially if you organize more events, then you, you can uh, always come to that document and uh, you can, during your meetings, uh, you can point uh, to this one and also share this document with uh, the venue and, and the others who are involved and need, need the information. Of course, each event costs some money and uh, we need to work with a budget. So it's another um, part uh, of, of the event planning. So here, I really recommend to do the budget um, forecast in advance, because as we know, event is not just about uh, the catering or, or the venue or the venue. There is more things which we have to um, consider. And 
what really works well for me that I usually do two options that it's um, the pessimistic and uh, the optimistic one. Um, the difference between these two uh, will show you kind of reserve, which should be, um, or it's recommended 10% um, um, of the budget. And uh, if you are not experienced too much, uh, I would recommend you to keep it for the event itself and use it for unexpected uh, expenses. Uh, these um, unexpected expenses might be extra dinner or some gifts or you need the transport for um, VIP guests um, or there is many, many more which and then uh, if you have the budget tied and you don't have this reserve, then you might end up in, in trouble because you need to solve this situation very quickly. And uh, then you have to look into your uh, budget and, and you have to find these extra uh, costs. The other option is that you can release that reserve before the event and upgrade uh, your catering or, or the other part of of um, the budget uh, um, items. What, what really works for me also, and uh, I really recommend it to work on the budget regularly and, and update it also during, during the event and also close to the event, uh, because then you have the forecast and once you are coming closer uh, to the event, then it might change. So uh, that, that uh, will help you to keep track where you are. So another very important part of um, event planning um, is the advertising and also the um, information which need, needs to be shared about the event. What I see um, quite often um, that the everybody focus on the planning and uh, the the information about the event is going out uh, to public very late. We have to here consider that people are planning their calendars uh, far, far in advance. And it's very shame that, that if they get uh, the information for your very interesting event very late, and uh, then it's clashing with their other plans and they can't come just because of uh, uh, we came with the information late so um, i call it here save the date invitation so um, i really recommend here to to send it once you set the date for for the event um, this save the date invitation ideally should go out with the event website link this event website link can be absolutely draft uh, it can be just the preliminary information. If you have the date, title, timeline, ideally a keynote speaker because this or something would might attract people to put that save the date invitation to their calendar. Um, also the event fee, if people want to know if the event will be free or if uh, it will cost something. And also um, the information about the accommodation, if you have them, if not, that's fine, absolutely to skip it at the beginning. And uh, if you have the um, uh, accommodation and even fee, it also needs to go with the cancellation policy, because this is also something what's what, um, missing quite often. And then um, if you do not share this information, it might cause you trouble. Um, at the end because then people start to cancel very late and um, uh, they don't know that they have to pay the fee. Um, reminders to non-registered uh, or to registered uh, participants. This is also an uh, important part because um, my experience is that if somebody is organizing the event, uh, People don't want to bother the others with too many reminders, but it, it's not relevant for the events. 
because uh, people are receiving a lot of like all of us are receiving a lot of um a lot of information a lot of emails and um sometimes they might skip it uh, so i really recommend here to send it a few times and uh, don't rely on people that they know that you send it once then um the information uh, to registered people, I mean that uh, sometimes uh, I see it, it happens and um, it, it's causing uh, people to forget uh, to come to the event. So once you close the registration, uh, I really recommend to send the final information to all who registered and, and this final information email uh, should include the final program because at the beginning we advertise the preliminary one. Uh, it's also important to inform uh, when you will open the registration during th that event, who is the contact person who uh, they should find uh, at the venue. Uh, also, we can include the information who will be the photographer or that there will be the photographer uh, and also what they should do if they don't want to be photographed or if we have the video maker then what they should do if they don't want to be on the video and and many other um, information some some people add the information about the weather in the local uh, place and other uh, I really recommend to do it and you will see that people appreciate that a lot uh, because they will get the information uh right before the event so for event itself um here um i have listed a few actions um which i think will help you to um, have the event under better control because um if I'm not sure if you are planning to organize the event or if you already have the experience uh, with the other event. But what I can tell during the event, there is a lot of things happening at the same time. This is that multitasking, which I mentioned before. And uh, we as a main organizers, um, as a one person, we are able to take care of just one thing. We are not able to, uh, to be at the five places at the same time. So here, um, I would like to recommend you to assign the roles and responsibilities to your team members. So don't uh, rely on yourself only that you will be able to do everything. Uh, what really works well for me, uh, that if I prepare the minute by minute scenario for that organizing team, then everybody knows uh, who what, what is going to happen who should be where and uh, who is who who's backup uh, what is really good especially for the um, longer events uh, to do the briefing before that event in the morning with the team members if you have a longer event it's good to do it every day uh, every, every day in the uh, in the morning or before you start just to remind uh, you can also touch the program changes, which is sometimes happens, and just be sure that everybody uh, everybody knows everything. It's also good to identify your own deputy, just in case that you don't feel very well or you you uh, are or you need to be in in some different place. What I usually do with my team that I'm using the registration desk. Uh, not just for to register people but also as a help desk is the place where uh, all participants can come and uh, they they will always find the updated information they always find somebody from um, organizing team and they know that they can um, ask in, in my experience this help desk is always busy if if it's if it's there and people know that they can come, um, it it can really save um, 
and pre uh, prevent a, a lot of uh, troubles and also when people are lost or they they need a lot of things during uh, during the event uh, if you are not able to do it um, like have uh, somebody present a whole day uh, I recommend to do the information board which might be the supplement for that help desk so um, you have just you have the board there with all the information again the program changes the contact maybe the the mobile phone if they need um, someone to call last um, thing which i would like to mention and it's for um long discussion but what i i really see um often in in the other events that um uh the badges name badges uh are not uh done correctly really this is really something what, what can also help to improve your event uh, i don't want to talk too much about it just uh, i thought that it's important to mention it here just to make the, the name badges uh, easy to read uh, if you have the if you use the, the lanyards uh, just make sure that um, the badges are double-sided and it's um, big letters then um, pe people can see it because it really made people much more comfortable at the event if they are having the network and, and they know uh, who they are uh, talking to. The general recommendation for the event organizers um, is and it, it really works well for me and it brings you the good feedback if you are always one step ahead of the program and uh, you keep your eyes open because if you check the meeting room and it's fine it doesn't mean that it will be fine in five minutes so it's a hard work uh, but i can recommend this to just be around and uh, i'm pretty sure that um, our participants will appreciate that so the phase three what um, we should do after the events. So um, many times I see that that one event is done. We are all all pleased that uh, it happened and it's all done. We just think about to pay the invoices, uh, but it's really good to got. Uh, it's it's really good to have uh, the feedback and. Uh, which can help you um, to improve the, the the future events, and you can also share the, the feedback with the venue and on all the other participants uh, in the part, uh, not the participants, but the committee, because um, committees, program committees, usually taking care of the program only, and they are in in the meeting room and they don't see what is happening around. So. If you plan to do it, I recommend to you to do uh, this, what I listed here. So prepare the questionnaire in advance, uh, test it with your colleagues that uh, all the questions are okay, uh, or they have the other um, suggestions. Um, have that questionnaire ready uh, in advance to be able to send it during the last session or even earlier uh, because people are already have the feeling from from the meeting and it really helps you to um, bring more uh, responses so it's also important to um, ask the last speaker to to remind that this survey will come uh, to participants email in the closing remarks because then it brings their attention and, and they will uh, do uh, they will reply this uh, it's also good to mention how long does it take because if you say it's just five minutes then uh, um, it might help to get more responses too um, after you send the first one it's recommended to send uh, one or two uh, reminders in a couple of days after the event. Um, 
here it's it's my personal opinion uh, that if the survey with a response rate is lower than 25%, uh, I usually do not take it as a relevant and we do not work with that. So this, what I just mentioned, should help you to, uh, to get more than 30% and then uh, you can work and analyze the feedback. What I recommend, a free version of Google Form is absolutely easy one uh, and everybody knows that so you can find it in, in a Google. Uh, also what I use very often is a survey monkey. It's paid uh, but it has a lot of tools uh, for the analyze as a uh, you can download it as a uh, PowerPoint or Excel or the other. So another part um, of today's uh, webinar is related to EU funding um, and uh, the rules which uh, we need to apply for, for the events uh, which are funded from a European project. Um, very often uh, we have the events uh, which we we just know that it needs to happen. It's part uh, in it's part of the work package in the project, and uh, the description is very broad. This is my experience. So here, I really before you start any planning, uh, I really recommend you to check the aim and the purpose of that event with a project leader or um, the work package leader because um, sometimes it's it says something and uh, that it was just an idea which will come uh, later when the work package starts so um, it's really the description sh should be there but uh, if you find it uh, brought then um, please check it um, another important part which needs to be checked before you start the, the entire planning uh, and also need to be considered in advance are the rules for funding. So uh, there might be the limits and it's really recommended to um, again to, to check it with your local um, EU officer or uh, with a project management office also the, the purchasing department um, because there might be limits for catering, accommodation, travel or sometimes the projects are able to fund just part of that. So uh, and uh, if you are not sure then there is uh, the link to annotated model Crown and Freeman article 6.1 eligible cost, other direct cost, which is the general one. For if you find out that um, the project or the, the work package um, is not uh, it's not able to fund the whole event uh, and, and uh, it's able to fund just part of that. There might be the question and it's all very often coming to, to me if there is possible to somehow co-fund these um, events either with a sponsorship or conference fees uh, or the other public money. Here um, it depends on project uh, and that's why I said that it needs to be checked in advance but most of the EU projects um, uh, are are not allowed to use that money and it's considered as your income and it's very risky because if you do not check it in advance you might end up that it will be deducted from your final funding because it's considered, as I mentioned, as, as an income. So uh, this is, it happened in the past to me. So I have the experience with that. And, and believe me, it's 
then it's a lot of hassle to work with that. So this, uh, if nothing else, this uh, is really something what, what needs to be checked um, in advance. With uh, EU projects and EU grants, uh, I think we all know, and uh, it's obvious that all these projects might be audited one day. So if we already know that uh, we have the funding, uh, everything is uh, is fine with uh, the description uh, and the event is happening, we have to be sure and follow the rules, uh, which will also prove that the event uh, was related to, to the project. So here uh, in the slide, you can see the example of the um, attendance sheet where you can see the logos and, and the project number description, that logo link with uh, which includes the EU flag, that the number of the project and the description. This uh, should be um, mentioned in each document you use for the event. So program agenda, attendance sheet, even um, the logo should be on the badge, uh, ideally on the slide deck. So uh, this is very important and, and this is also mentioned in each project description. So this is something also would need to be uh, checked in advance. Regarding the attendance sheet, is is um, something what we should do for each event, which is funded from EU grants. Um, many projects requires the signature for each day. It might sound strange, but um, not everyone are participating um, every day. But even if you have the five days event, you and it's written in the project, you might really need five signatures. So here um, you can see in my example that we had a two days event and we were asking for two signatures for each day separately. Hard copy of uh, the attendance sheet needs to be archived. Uh, my experience is that most of the EU projects um, is having five years, so I, I didn't put here a number, but uh, again, please check it with your um, uh, project management unit, uh, how long uh, it needs to be archived and, and make sure that you have it ready for audit, because if audit comes, they mostly require the, the hard copy. What can also help you to prove uh, the eligibility for the um, event uh, uh, funded from um, project are the, uh, the photos. Uh, so what we usually do is that we are making the photos of everything what has a logo. So the, the slides, if you have this logo and everything on the slide deck, so it's good to have the photos with that. Each project, uh, if you are running the event, um, it, it's highly recommended to have a banner uh, so you can make the, the photos with people sending with that banner. Everything you you never know when when my when you might need it because when the audit comes, they really want to see as much uh, as uh, you can to to, to provide uh, for that. Um, I think that we can come back to, to this um, also when we have the time for questions, if, if you have more questions. But um, as I mentioned before, I would like to also talk about the event communication, which is also the important part of uh, the events planning. So we already spoke, um, or I already spoke um, about the um, information to the people who are registered or those who uh, are still hesitating or they are still not registered. 
So um, I would like to mention here again that we should we shouldn't forget uh, to save the date invitation um, to also the follow up invitation. Uh, the event website, as I mentioned before, uh, should go on the draft and as soon and make it live as soon as possible. So another tool for the event communication is or how to announce that the event is um, happening are the posters. It's an old fashioned version nowadays, but it still works well. So if you have uh, the places in your institutes, just try to put them everywhere uh, you can. Um, you shouldn't forget about the general event calendars. So um, if you are at the, the university or if you um, if it's part of the cluster projects, ask your partners to share it into the, their event calendars. Um, it's basically the whole communication strategy, which also should be part of the planning phase of, of the event. Uh, sometimes for the big events what, what we you what we are using that if you have your um, email signature you can add uh, the small banner with that save the date invitation or the um, invitation or on the information that the event uh, uh, is happening and it basically goes to all your colleagues and people who are in touch with uh, via email um uh, reminders to, to those who are registered and if you are not registered yet that that's what we already mentioned feedback um again it's it's very important um and i think it should be done after each event because people um during the event are very shy um or sometimes you have a short event so you don't have time to catch everyone and uh, you can also, uh, after the event, share the photos with participants. Every, everybody loved that. So it's very good uh, if you um, send the, the final email to say goodbye. Thank you for partic participating at the event. These are the photos or the slides. Um, part of our work is also the um, social media. And it's also part of, of the communication. Um, usually it's good and I really recommend to use the dedicated person in your institute to do it because um, uh, if you are the event organizer, you probably will not have time to, um, to use social media during the event. Uh, if you are the only one, uh, I really recommend to use uh, the Twitter because people like to to tweet during the event. Um, you should share the uh, Twitter hashtag before the event, during the event. Uh, um, we usually put it everywhere where it's possible to. Uh, it's on um, printed on the program. It's mentioned on on the uh, badge sometimes uh, also. Um, at that uh, help desk, uh, at the welcome slides, everywhere where you can. And if nothing else uh, from the social media is used during the, um, the event, I really recommend to use Twitter. Facebook, uh, you can have the, the Facebook event page, um, but uh, I, I think nowadays mostly people use the Twitter. Photos are very important. So if you have the professional photographer, it's good to ask him to share the photos uh, with you as soon as possible, um, especially these group photos or uh, the keynote talks, uh, because um, uh, the professional photographers tend to uh, have some time to tweak the photos and then work with them. So it's also good to ask them as soon as possible and use these uh, photos for the Twitter and uh, during the event. Uh, you can also have the tweets ready before the event. So um, you can use that queue um, 
and uh, have them ready. Um, we just started to do the podcast. It's something um, what is also um, now nowadays uh, happening a lot. Um, and uh, but I think, um, as I heard, that there will be the uh, follow-up webinar just for the communication. So I would finish uh, my communication part here, and uh, I would like to talk briefly about the um, GDPR in, in events. So um, it's very complex also, and I think it's uh, we can have the one webinar itself just related to GDPR in events. But um, here I have listed uh, the most important parts. So the process what is happening with the data which we are collecting uh, from the registration, for example, should be part of your institute privacy policy. Uh, it should say and um, describe uh, where are the data from the registration stored, how long, how they are working with, how you are working with them. Um, and uh, this is something um, very tricky, but it, it should be it should be part of the privacy policy. Um, of course, when we collect the, the data from registration, we have quite a lot of information about each person and uh, we we are storing them. We we follow our privacy policy. It's all fine. But what will happen in case we have to share the information with the restaurants, with the uh, uh, venues, hotels, and the others? So here, all the data which we are sending out uh, should be in encrypted documents. It's very hard to do it, um, but um, it should, again, uh, the, the venue or the restaurant or the other suppliers should have their own privacy policy and they should uh, behave uh, uh, according to that and have it GDPR compliant. So uh, I think it really depends how big is the event and which data are you collecting. Um, but if it's something big, too many people, it's very good to double check with um, the venue, usually the hotel or the conference center, uh, what they are doing with these data. Um, we already mentioned that uh, all the data are coming to, to the event registration. So, um, we used in the past the, the for the registration uh, the Google document, which was open to everyone. Uh, but uh, here uh, I really need to emphasize that it's um, it, it's very uh, highly risky, and uh, I really recommend to use um, some registration tool which is GDPR compliant. Um, one of the examples is Eventbrite which is free. It's not 100% GDPR compliant because you are not the owner of the data, but you have somehow the control. You can close the registration, you can uh, work with uh, uh, the rights who can enter to, to this. So, so if you have the tool for, for the registration, you really have to um, include the questions uh, for the consent for sharing the data after the events because everybody or all, all participants like to have or receive the participant list which might include the um, email address or other uh, related um, information to the event so this uh, is very important to have the consent in, in the registration in advance. What I usually do that I'm, uh, I'm very specific what we are going to share. So the question is, um, do you consent to share your name, surname, affiliation, email address, and whatever we, we are going to share? 
And then when they, you might be surprised how many people say no. So in my experience, it's like 10% in each even, sometimes even uh, more. So uh, then you have to take these people out when you are making this final uh, final list. This is the same thing is with uh, photographing and making the video. Nowadays, a lot of people don't want to be photographed and uh, with uh, GDPR, it's um, it's very important that you have the consent that they, um, they are happy to be photographed. If not, then uh, you have to inform them what they should do in the case they don't want to be on the photo. Uh, what I usually do is we inform them they need to come to the registration desk, they need to find one of uh, the organizer or we introduce the photographer and they just let him know um, that they don't want to be on, on the photo. Um, I think this is the only one way if you have um, a lot of people. So here, um, I would like to finish um, today's webinar. I hope you find my tips um, and recommendation useful. Um, because we had the limited time today and uh, there is a lot of things which we uh, we can mention. I have prepared uh, the guideline and checklist document, uh, which has more details uh, for preparation of your future event. So you can download it here. Um, the document will be um, available to, to download also later. So. Um, help yourself and I will be happy if you use it. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can always contact me uh, on my email address or you can visit uh, my website. Um, so um, thank you for your attention and I wish you good luck with your future events. Thank you, Dana. So we'll, we'll continue from here with some questions. We'll also make sure that, like I said, we're going to share the slides so it'll be easy for you to download this events guideline um, document. So there's a couple of questions um, that have been submitted around um, the registration software. So we've got one question asking which platform you would recommend to use for registration that's GDPR compliant. And then there's also a question actually about whether you've used EasyChair before, whether it is GDPR compliant and what you see as kind of pros and cons of different um, software. Yeah, it's a very good question. And it's uh, something what we, since the GDPR came in place, uh, uh, we are all facing this, this question. Um, it's hard to answer because uh, uh, most of the free tools are not GDPR compliant. So um, in Elixir, we are using uh, Eventbrite because it, it's free and um, we are running most of the events which are, we, we do not collect the money. So that's why uh, we, we use it. But um, if you want to be 100% GDPR compliant, I really recommend you to buy the software. I can, if you send me an email, I can recommend to you a few companies uh, which you, which they do. It, it's now, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, companies which are doing that and you can buy th that software just for one event. Uh, you pay um, according to um, number of participants or you can buy the annual uh, license. There is uh, many things, but nothing free is 100% GDPR compliant. If yes, then I, I would like to, I would be happy. If you have something, please share it with, with me too. Uh, regarding the Easy Chair, uh, we use the Easy Chair just for collecting the uh, posters, uh, the abstracts. And I think it's uh, absolutely fine. Um, it also, I think it, it depends also on, on the version. So if you have the paid version, I think it's uh, more uh, restricted. It's not as open, but I never use the easy chair for the event registration. Yeah, so thank you very much. There's also a question around the, the kind of consent for photographs, kind of pointing out that not just do you need the consent in the first place, 
but you also need a legal basis for the future use of any photos that you might take during the event. And I think this is definitely a good point. I know that, for instance, for the for the Emble one, this is part of what you can send in the registration. It already says there what it will be used for in the future. So this is a really good point. So I think this also should be part of the privacy policy and uh, you can always point people there. Um, so with what, what we usually do uh, with the events from uh, from from with the photos from the events, uh, there are two categories. Uh, one is the group photo when you ca cannot identify the people, then then it's all fine. But once you have the photo which says that this person is that 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 um, that, that this kind of photos um, needs to be GDPR compliant, and and you you should um, have that process written in, in the privacy policy. So all everything should be there and you always need to point into that. Yeah. And I think in the privacy policy, you would also point to, for instance, if you use SurveyMonkey for the survey, again, they should be listed there. If you use Eventbrite for your registration, that should be listed there. So that's really something where you want to have all of those kind of third party software that you might use listed, I think. And also, it's just coming to my mind now is it's also the time how long are you archiving this uh, also the information from the registration um, um, in our case for the small events which we do not need for the ukrans we say uh, we are archiving that three months so uh, then we delete that and to also think about who you're going to share the data with. So obviously, as Anne already pointed out, you're going to need to share some of the data with the hotel and the catering companies. But also you may need to share it outside your organization with the organizing committee or, you know, the EU project that you're working on. So all of these things should all be listed in the um, in the privacy policy and they should be consenting to all of this. So another question that we've got, which is more of a, a kind of question to you on whether you can share your planning document, a kind of empty version of that. Now, I don't know whether that's as such directly already shown in the events guidelines or whether this would be something separate. So, yes, I, I can share it, uh, but it's um, different for each event. So I can share one example. But what, what is usually there is, or what is always repeating, is the timeline, is the organizing committee with all the um, contacts, uh, and it's uh, also the program and the actions. I think this is the main important thing. And then it really depends uh, on on the type of event. But I'm. Um, always asking all parts of the organizing committee if they are doing their own evaluation of the projects or their own internal planning if they can use that documents because we never know who of us um, will need these information and um, so um, it's not part of it. the event guideline and checklist is very general. Uh, I try to make it general for different types of events. But of course, if you send me an email, I can send uh, a few examples. So then another question we've got on the archiving of the hard copy of, for instance, the attendance list. Who needs to actually do that? Is it the partner that's organizing the event or is it the project coordinator or does it not matter? So um, in our case, in Elixir, for example, how we did it is um, uh, that it's uh, with the event organizer, uh, event manager, but um, some project managers uh, who are Manning the, the project are keeping that with them. So it needs to be somewhere when when the audit comes, the the project manager will need to show and uh, have this information ready. So it's I, I really recommend to either uh, the project 
management office or the event um, managers. We have it in the place where everybody knows where is it. Um, and I always do the scan. So I always do the scan copy, uh, have it in the confidential um, um, folder. And then the hard copy is in the event folder. Okay, good. So um, one additional question I've actually got, because this has happened to us before, and um, it's something where we got caught out a little bit. What if you do joint events? So for instance, you've got two Horizon 2020 projects, you're doing a joint event. This could either be one event that's completely joined, or what you see a lot is back-to-back -back events, where you know it's the same venue, um, partially the same people. How do you make sure that you actually stay compliant with EU rules? So the trickiest part is if uh, there is the overlapping thing, like uh, lunch all together, then it's hard. Uh, but if it's um, at the same venue, two events, and, and there is somehow the, the cutoff um, line, then I always um, recommend to inform the venue and um, keep it uh, very, very separate as much as you can. So uh, the ven for venue, it might look like one event, but venue should understand that for us, it's two different fundings. We will need two different invoices because um, each invoice will go to um, the, the different project. Um, it's also related to attendance sheet, I think. So uh, you either need to, depends on the project rules, but um, if you have that one joint event, you might end up to, that you need two different attendance sheets with uh, logos and everything, as, as we mentioned today. Uh, that And if people participate both, that they probably need to sign both of these documents or if you um, coordinate both projects and, and you are sure that you can use the same same attendance sheet for example you just need to put uh, both logos and bo both description but everything what we mentioned today uh, for um, for uh, the, the rules for funding should be done for both projects um, I really do not recommend to do it. It's always um, a lot of troubles. I, I really recommend to do it separately at least a day uh, or do just one lunch and, and, and another lunch. Uh, but uh, keep it separately as much as, as you can. Uh, and the venue, that's the key thing. Venue should understand that it's for you, it's two different funding that they should behave. Uh, so, and they should uh, make the, that's also important to that budget forecast. So if you do the budget forecast for for these two joint even, it's good to have two budgets um, and keep them separately. Um, and also have the maybe two purchase order numbers um, because then when you do everything together and after the event you try to divide it, then uh, it never works well. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to do one more question and then we have to wrap up. So this is again around GDPR, but it's what if you have an or when you're organizing an event outside Europe, is there additional legislation that you need to check or be aware of? Okay, interesting question. Um, I uh, have never organized the um, event outside of Europe. So I'm afraid that I will close that. that uh, um, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, I would probably uh, go and um, internally to check it with, uh, again, with uh, those who are uh, responsible for um, privacy policy, the, the internal um, lawyers. So one thing that I would add to this is make sure you remain GDPR compliant. One thing that can be a problem is you're sharing data outside countries that are covered by GDPR. So that's going to be your tricky part. So that if you, for instance, share data with local organizers or hotels, they may not be GDPR compliant. So that's where you need to be careful. 
Um, but again, if you have consent from people to take the data to share it with the local organizer, that's really important. But I would really agree with Dana saying go and ask for some advice because this this is tricky and um, it really will depend where you're organizing and what you're sharing. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we've um, run out of um, time. Um, the only thing I'd like to do is, is thank um, Dana and um, thank you all for coming. Um, if we can just find the presentation for a second, I want to just announce the next Corabel um, webinar. So we'll um, go on a question, um, we'll go on a Christmas break um, and we'll continue again on the 14th of January. The registration isn't live yet, but the time and date have been fixed. So this will be the BBMRI LC services across the nodes and BMS um, RIs with Michaela Meyerhofer from BBMRI Eric. So thank you very much, everyone, and um, see you in the new year.